Welcome, Charlotte, to the show. Thank you for having me. Really Excited to be here. Appreciate you giving us access to the owner's suite. I mean, yes. uh, what better it's game day. Yeah. Start of the season, and, and here you are. You're in right the exact position to call all the plays <laughs> and hopefully and be I'm the one sure. in charge of a great victory today. I'm sure they're going to give me play calling ability, yeah, too. Right? Exactly. <laughs> I'm sure they're going to, hey, take my, will you take my call? <laughs> all right, so the first part of what we do is called truth or donate. Now, if you choose to answer the question, I will donate to your favorite charity, which is? The Salvation Army. Okay. Absolutely. And if you don't, then they don't get a check. But if they do, okay. I am going to donate to the Salvation Army. Okay, okay. okay. So this is three great. Questions. Put the money in the red kettle. Get ready. <laughs> Hope you have deep pockets. All right. Well, it's $100 per question. Okay. Oh, Not wow. Not deep okay. questions, that's, but that's deep enough. every little bit helps. Okay, so right. if I answer it, then you have to donate. I do. Uh -huh. now, if you don't okay. answer it, then I, I don't. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. So you total freedom no, you got here me to nervous, say no. But yes. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. What do you really hope your parents don't find out about? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that that's that's pretty amazing question. Um, maybe I should say we just got through building uh, our our new headquarters, the Star, okay. and I'm sure that he will, but I hope he doesn't find out exactly how much money we spent. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. In terms of team marketability, if you could recruit any NFL player that's not currently wearing a Cowboys uniform, who would that be? Ah, any About NFL marketing the player team, yes. that's not currently wearing a uniform. Yeah. Can I pick one that used to wear the uniform? Sure. Okay. Yeah. We're going to bring back Roger Staubach. <laughs> Roger Staubach. Yes, I Captain love it. America. <laughs> You know, that, that whole, that's the, the original, the whole America's team thing. You know, he's, what he's he responsible doing these days? for such a significant part of our, of our history. I know he, he runs a real estate company. What else is yes, he doing these Yes, days? he does. I mean, that's, that's really where he spends most of his time. And, of, of course, um, he'll be here with us today because uh, this is a very patriotic day for us. And he is very engaged um, in, in the military and what, what that represents for our country. So he's, he's always a great spokesperson and certainly a great leader right. and a great friend. I didn't make these questions hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already spent two hundred dollars. What do you? What is? What is something that people think you would never do, but you have? Wide open question here. What do people? Think that, yeah. That I would never do. Yeah, but you have. Um, boy, that's that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> Man, that's really hard. I don't know how personal to get on that one because that that could be uh, condemning. You don't have to answer. <laughs> Nothing wrong with passing. You know, um, go in and talk to Coach Garrett about the plays. Wow. How about so that? He, does he listen to you? Oh, you know what? Have he listens. It doesn't necessarily mean that okay. that he enacts acts what what I suggest. No, I don't call the plays. But I do go in there to actually be better educated about what's going on. So. Okay. Have you? Yes. Do you have a coaching career in the future? That no, we don't, absolutely we should know about? not. No. Your son's team. Maybe? You know, you've heard of like stick to your lane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I stick to my lane. Wow. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Charlotte, what do people not understand about marketing the Dallas Cowboys? Because to me, it'd be seem like uh, I mean, this is just me. One of the easiest jobs in the world, but I know it's not. So tell me, you know what? What people don't understand about marketing you know, the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, that that is interesting, and and you know we certainly in, enjoy a lot of, of visibility and interest, uh, which is great. Uh, but when when you don't have the same kind of success on the field that you hope for and that people hope for, it makes your job a lot more challenging. Uh, I w I would say this that. Uh, you know, the, also the most misconstrued or misconceived thing is, is, is we, we market 365 days a year. We yeah. may only play 16 games, but our efforts are evergreen. And, and we reach not only the people who come into the stadium, but it is, it is a daily conversation. Uh, it is about educating all of those who uh, are in our organization that every touch point that we have is, is an engagement with our fan. So everything matters from the ticket takers at the stadium to those who are doing the podcasts back at our headquarters. Every engagement matters and it's all very well thought out, but it's also about pride. It's about understanding the legacy and the tradition of the Cowboys and making sure that you respect that in everything that you do. Now, where did this philosophy come from? Did it start day one in 1989 when the team was bought or did it you know, evolve over time? Over time. Well, we were so fortunate. The reason that uh, my father even had the interest that he did in the Dallas Cowboys was because of the incredible 
history and legacy of the team. I mean, that they were iconic from the beginning, and yeah. it certainly, you know, through the 60s and 70s, and, and when he had a chance to become involved with the Dallas Cowboys, it was because of that aura, because of the brand, because of the star. So that was set up well before that. As a matter of fact, when I first came to work and got recruited by my father to come down, the first thing he said was, find a way to stop losing money, and whatever you do, don't tarnish the star. So it was on the forefront of absolutely every decision that we made. And weren't you just starting out your career? I mean, he put a lot of faith in you at, uh, what were you, 23, you know, 24? Ex exactly. Was... Um, long ago, 20-some <laughs> years ago. It was I didn't say <laughs> quite a while ago. But, uh, you, you know, I think that was it. Uh, my father really wanted people around him that he could trust. I, I think he recognized early on that that you can make a mistake, you'll learn from your mistake, your mistake, but it won't be because you didn't put in the effort, the time, and the passion to try to make the best out of everything that you did. And and for me, it was an incredible uh, responsibility, but such an incredible opportunity to Definitely. to seize that and to take it and, and to to recognize um, the opportunities at hand and to be able to to hopefully, you know, take that legacy and build upon it and, and make it even greater than where we began with it. So why do you think he entrusted a 23-year-old, no offense, you went to Stanford, which is great, <laughs> but a 23-year-old versus some of the industry veterans that were out there? What was it about you, do you think? That oh, well, I, I think, um, and this is probably very consistent in, in our entire organization, I think it's about passion and I think it's about heart and I think it is about understanding that you know this is a privilege to be a part of the Dallas Cowboys right. and we get to, to wake up and come here and and be a part of this incredible tradition and legacy and and you have to to honor that and, and know where that placement is so that in every decision that you make and every challenge that you reach that you're doing it with the best interest of everyone at heart and, and of those who came before you and and I think you know, that's it. You know, are you going to lay awake at night trying to figure out how to solve a problem or trying to be innovative and creative in the space? Then, then that's where it is. It's all about the passion and it's about the vision. Well, you've done such a great job with the team. Thank you. But when I say the term business success, when I say, say the term business success, who immediately comes to mind? My dad, Jerry Jones. Uh, you know, Why your dad? I, I, I have to say that just because of. Uh, obviously, I mean, take a look around of, of what where we're sitting yeah. here. But just um, you know, having having passion about what you do, but having a vision to take risks, um, I I think puts you on a whole nother level. And I think my father has always had an incredibly high tolerance for ambiguity, not knowing what tomorrow brings, but knowing that in that moment of today, you have the responsibility to try to make it great, but you also need the foresight and the innovation to push it forward. And he embodies that, and I think it's something that he has instilled in every one of us around. Is there a specific example that you have that kind of exemplifies you know, his drive, his success, his, I, I know he laid it all on the line to buy the team. I, well, I think that's where it starts, right? At, you know, in the beginning, we, you know, the Dallas Cowboys were for sale because they were losing $75,000 yeah. a day and over a million dollars a month. And in that, that's not a smart business decision. He did yeah. not get into this for, for the business of sports. He got in it because he loved the game and he loved the team. And in that, you know, you, you set up and you, you sit there of how, how, do you, how do you bring that forward and, and how do you make it a successful unit on and off the field? And you know the old saying, necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. And there you go, you know, you try things that, that don't work and you, and you learn from those mistakes and you get up and you try it again and then you find that success. But I, I think uh, not being, uh, not fearing risk uh, but also putting everything you have into it gives you a, a, a new kind of motivation. Yeah, I mean, from what I heard, he put everything on the line and he just went for it. You know, ab absolutely everything he had on the line. You know, this was all on Black 29, you know, here you go. Yeah. And it's it's either going to be incredibly successful or incredibly not. Yeah. And I, I think there was no there was no middle ground there. You of, had to be successful. Of how do you make it work? And you were on such a big stage yeah. that 
you just couldn't fail. You know, you, you couldn't do it in front of the world. So how do you how do you prevent that? And and how do you fight and and dream and create to get yourself out of that? And and I think you know probably one of the greatest things is that when when he bought the team, you know, the NFL didn't hand you a blue book and says this is how you run, you know, yeah. an NFL team. So you so never there is had no book? A, so there is no book. <laughs> there is no book. There was no pre preconceived idea of okay. this is how you do it. I think it was about having having a fresh vision and and ideas of, of why not? Let's try it. Let's try it and see if it works, see if it's successful. But at the core of it is understanding that our fans of this game are so very passionate about what the Dallas Cowboys mean to them that it's more of like a culture and a and a lifestyle. It's it's not just about a transaction. You know, it's it's far more than that. And and that every day that's on the top of mind for all of us. Okay, so let's go back to 1989 when the team yeah. was purchased, right? Yeah. It was losing $75,000 a day. What were the first things that you did, either with your father or just by yourself, yeah. to kind of get the spend down, or if that was what right. you did, or increase revenues? I mean, right. what, were, what were the specifics? Yeah. Don't tarnish a star <laughs> and find a way to stop the bleeding. You know, that that's the mantra, that that was the charge. and. And the first thing that you might do is go in and, and get the ledger and figure out where your biggest, you know, red line items are. And and when I looked at that, that you know, the biggest expense was training camp. And and for years we had gone out to Thousand Oaks, the Cowboys prior to us, yeah. uh, began training camp in Thousand Oaks, California. Uh, that was significant uh, cost ramification to do so. Uh, so we brought the team to Austin, Texas. We set up training camp there, and then. One by one, we started with each line item. So if we were spending X amount of money on laundry, I went down to the local dry cleaner and knocked on their door and said, we're gonna have all these people at wow. practice. If we put a sign out there, can you do our dry cleaning for free? Let's do a barter. And yeah. so it was barter after barter, little things all the way to the big things. And, and that's what we've learned. So did every you literally hit every line item and <laughs> try to negotiate? <laughs> Everything. It was about the food. It was about the laundry. It was about, you know, all, all of the things, the housing, you know, all of it, the transportation, every aspect of, of the expense and operating a training camp is, was the first natural place to start. The other thing was, was how do you engage the community and make them part of, of what you're doing. So, you know, we did the things that now seem pretty commonplace in, in a golf tournament or an event, you know, had some failures. You know, I learned real quickly, don't put a player in a black tie. He will not be excited about coming back the next day. You know, do the things that, that's easy for them, do the things that they enjoy, but most importantly, do the things that engage the fans and let them see and get access to your team in ways they haven't before. Right, right. So when when you think about that fan engagement, as I'm switching over, and you think about the community around the Cowboys, what are the specific things at a high level that you're doing to kind of create and nurture that right now? Well, first of all, fan engagement is probably our single most important priority of everything we do with the Cowboys. It's about how do you deepen that connection with your fan uh, even more so. And, and we know that that's not just here at the stadium because as a matter of fact, only 7% of our fans will ever come into this stadium. The well, others are it's, everywhere. It's sold out. Yeah. And, <laughs> which is great. Yes, yeah. we have a, we have a sellout, which is right. which is wonderful. But that engagement extends far beyond the venue itself. So everything that we do, all the content that we we produce, we put platforms out there. So no matter how you consume content or where you consume your content, that there's something for you. There's a story for you. There's a way for you to relate to our team, maybe in ways that you haven't been before. What specific examples, in terms of technology, you pointed to the phone? I know you got uh, one of the, the best Wi-Fi situations yeah. here, but can you just talk about specifics about what you're I was doing? Say, well, it, it all starts right with the backbone and the infrastructure of your system, and, and probably the most specific thing and best thing that we ever did was partner with AT and T. And we look to them for everything cutting edge and futuristic to make sure we know what's on the horizon, not when the phone rings and someone has the technology, it's what's coming down the pipe so that we're prepared to handle it. But probably most importantly is actually the infrastructure in here. You know, when you have 100,000 people and yeah. they're all trying to share their content or take their content or receive it, all at the same time, you know, our system in here between the DAS and the Wi-Fi is like the size of McKinney, Texas, a whole city here in Texas with the amount of, of infrastructure that we actually have here in AT&T Stadium. So 
that's where it starts. And then you look at, at the ways that you can actually activate that technology. So, you know, either, whether it be from an app structure, digital tic ticketing, or, or whatever it is, th those platforms help us to be able to make that customer experience that much better. And so it's got to start at the beginning of the day, getting them in here to the stadium yeah. with the ease of, of flow and, and take them around the traffic when there is some, getting them to their seats, getting them to be able to engage uh, and share their experience here with their friends at home. And it's kind of a nonstop thing, not only at the game, but 365 days a year. Are you doing anything with the fans specifically and individually? I mean, do you have them in some kind of a database, CRM system? Ab absolutely. We have a CRM structure, but we also have another platform that is not really... Um, it, it's actually more based on how do we understand the most that we can about our individual fan and give them the content that is specific to them. If your son, who's... 12 years old, he consumes his content a lot differently than your mother consumes the content, and they're both fans. So we need to make sure that we can address that, offer that, and deliver it to them. And our system in Fan Manager does exactly that, and it allows us to create a profile of our fans and address those needs and their wants very individually as opposed to casting a broader net. Is it a proactive system where it just sends them emails or text messages? Well, we, we, create, we create all of that content, we address that content, we, we take that information and that data that we have and address the, con con the content structure, whether it be through podcasts or, or individual platforms or direct emails to them, and manage it by the fan as well as manage it to, as a general whole. I mean, what are your, do you have any success stories that you could share about how that fan engagement has done? Like, do you make somebody's day or... Because uh, there's all sorts of things I could see happening with the infrastructure that you have here and the fact that you know each of your individual fans. I mean, well, well, exactly right. Whether it be uh, being able to address um, a, a line at the concession stand of, of getting fee immediate feedback and being able to, to address that situation or toilet paper in the restroom that's there or you know just specifically the content they want to know more um, about you know our, our players they want to know more about the families being able to listen to that customer and that fan and then deliver the content based upon their request and uh, and I think um, being able to react in, in real time uh, you know we, we had an, a circumstance where you know there was kind of a, a rallying cry around a certain saying that our fans you know started in social media we, we took that concept we turned it in a t-shirt and all the fans in the stadium we're wearing it by the next game and so being able to kind of have that type of, of interaction and responsiveness I think is where the success lies. I mean are we at the point now where we can order food from concession stands on our phone yet or is that, is that getting close? Um, we, we you know some some stadiums do that mm -hmm. uh, we actually don't do that and, and specifically because we don't have the same challenges we have so many points of sale and different food offerings around the venue that that hasn't actually been um, a demand that has come from our fans. Uh, digital ticketing is is one thing that has yeah. has eased, you know, the the entree. Uh, but at the same time, we'll never get rid of our our hold, you know, the standard ticket. You know, that's a, a commemorative item. So there are some things that you do because it's tradition, and then there are other things that you do that's in response to to a fan response. Uh, what do you think is next around? What are you guys planning on doing now with fan engagement? How? Anything that you could share or talk about? Or? Well, we made a huge step in our new practice facility that really the star that right. is our headquarters as well as our indoor practice facility is Frisco High School's indoor stadium. So it is the home to eight different high schools that play every wow. Thursday and Friday night as well as our indoor practice facility. So as Dak practices on the field and he leaves, then here comes the high school quarterback on to, to practice and play their wow. actual game. And in that, I mean, really the star is, is a physical manifestation of our brand. There's retail around it, there's engagement around it, and it's a chance for fans to engage with our players on a whole nother level, to see where they work, train, and that's where they, they interact. So a chance encounter with the player that you might not get to come to the stadium, but you go out there and eat in one of the restaurants and you may bump shoulders with Tony Romo and you may interact or you may see Jason Witten getting out of his car and preparing for practice. So being able to, to connect deeper, that's the goal. So I didn't even realize this. They the Cowboys practice at the same place at the high schoolers play. Yes, yes. Wow. So that indoor practice facility yeah. is 
actually are training facilities. So on one side of the venue are all of the meeting rooms and all of our space and, and workout space for the players. On the other side of the field is the high school space. So they interact on the field and switch places as, as we train and they play. But the whole idea of that is, is a nod towards the future. You look towards your future fan, yeah. you look towards how do you create and harness that aspiration of wanting to grow up to be an NFL player, but most importantly, what does it do to inspire the rest of the community to feel like they have a sense of pride and a sense of place? Do they have, do you have a lot more press hanging around that, that particular venue then or well, scouts? Well, we have uh, other scouts. No, we don't have other, other scouts. We have our scouts. Right. We, ha we have always had a, a very large contingent of media that has been a part of our old training facility at Valley Ranch. Uh, so we manage that very similarly here at the Star. Uh, but certainly that, that touch point, that encounter is, is a lot more open and a lot more frequent. Okay. I mean, I, I, as a high school player myself, I would have loved to have had that environment. Yes, I mean, especially my son every day is like, how come I don't get to play over right? here? He's in ninth yes. grade. Is he in so high school? He's, or is he he's still in ninth grade. He's a freshman. Freshman. Yes. But does, he doesn't get to play on those fields? Or so, not no, he does not. You created the stadium? To Frisco. And he's, yeah. <laughs> the next uh, kind of area I'd like to cover yeah. is um, I'm going to present some scenarios. And I want to see okay. because you know, look what yes. you've done with the Cowboys, right? So if I put you in charge of the DMV <laughs> with a small $50,000 budget, how would you improve their customer experience? I mean, the bar is so low here. You could just say, say anything. Our favorite, everyone's favorite place, right? Yeah. Well, I, I would say this, first of all, I, I do think, you know, $50,000 on, on the scale of, of what they address is, One is not that much, right? Yeah. However, I think it can make a serious impact with it, but I think you got to turn inside first. I think it starts with the people that work for you. And I, I think you have to be able to articulate your vision, your goals, and the accountability of everybody within your organization first. That if that first touch point, you know, for us, our ticket takers are every bit as important to us as those who create the content that our fans consume. One bad experience can ruin the whole affiliation for, for any customer or any fan. But being able to motivate and empower those frontline people to, to want to, to be faster, to be more efficient, to be uh, you know, more responsive to every face that they meet can improve efficiency overnight. So I think the investment starts internally with the people, setting high standards and holding them accountable to what your standard is. But you gotta set the standard first to make sure so that- So there is no standard there then. <laughs> you said that, I didn't say that. <laughs> I, I mean, if it were me, I'd probably automate the whole thing, I mean, except for the driving test. I mean, McDonald's is Automation has done it. would be great. How much money did you give them? <laughs> 50000 Okay. Okay. But you'd save on salaries. <laughs> I would automate the whole thing, and I let people do it either online or through a kiosk, except for the driving test. I mean, you still have to have a human involved in that. We haven't got to automated driving yeah, yet. Yeah, not yet. Not yeah. yet, right? Yeah. All right, last question before we go into our bonus round. If you could undo one moment in your career, what would it be and why? That actually should have been in your first round of questioning <laughs> instead of I, instead I of. I thought right I was here. making it hard up front, but <laughs> actually, I would say this: I probably wouldn't undo anything because I think, and and by all means, all the decisions and, and things that I've done in my career have been far from from perfect. I've had plenty of failures along the way, uh, but I also think in your failure is where you really learn. And I think sometimes too, in your greatest challenges, you find your greatest opportunities. And I think being able to not repeat the same failure is, is the trick. But I, I think all of that experience is what makes us smarter. It's what helps us to actually see better and hopefully inform us to make better, more innovative and more responsible decisions in the future. So nothing specifically, just kind of, I liked my, my failures because I learned from them. Um, well, I don't think any of us like failure. I, yeah. I think that it's important though to learn from them. I think it's also important to understand that we're all going to have them. And I think not understanding that people that work with you and around you are going to fail sometimes, they've got to learn why and they've got to move from that. So you can't have perfection all of the time, but you have to be able to learn so you don't do it again. Yeah. I, th I thought you were going to say something about the stadium, but the stadium's probably one of the best in the league. So I. Thank something you. that you, you didn't get that, that you that, wanted that to get. That we missed yeah. on, on here? Well, um, 
I actually there's so there's, many details here. There's, I mean, there's so many details, yeah. just as there has been on, on our project that we've just completed with the star, that there is an, an inordinate amount of detail. And I think when you, you have the opportunity to to learn best practices from other people, to take influence, you know, outside your own market space to help you design and think and look forward to the future, that hopefully you, you catch those before you realize you've missed them. Okay, wonderful. This is going to be kind of great music I know, <laughs> towards the end of that question. <laughs> so for the bonus round, I chose Troy Aikman football from 1992. I figured Charlotte would love this game. This is going to be fun. A, B, and Y, okay? You just wait, 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 wait. We're not starting yet. Okay. But A, B, and Y. So I'm down here, you're up on top, and you choose what play you want to run. Since you are a coach, you're going to be fantastic. We should be playing fantastic. this on, like, the big board. Oh, if you could hook it up, I would have. Yeah. I want to surprise you with it. Can I call in backup? I need my son for this. No, you'll be fine. If you're giving uh, coaching advice to the coach, <laughs> you're going to be fine. All right, let's go. Okay. So are you the most powerful woman in football? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else said that, not me. So you didn't quite answer it. No, that's okay. where I make the donation. <laughs> <laughs> when you work out, would you prefer a spin class or a yoga class? Spin, <laughs> gotta sweat. Okay, gotta sweat. If the Cowboys and your son were playing football on the same day, which game would you go see? My son. <laughs> wow. Mm. I think that's just going to surprise a lot of people. When you're preparing your favorite sandwiches, would you rather add peppers or pickles? Peppers. Peppers? Why peppers? Yes. I like spicy. You like it spicy? Yes. Yes. Okay. If you could get anyone to perform during halftime of a Cowboys game, who would it be and why? Hmm. That is a good one because that is an annual question that we ask ourselves all the time. Um, Justin Timberlake. Justin Timberlake, okay. Mm -hmm. Justin, if you're listening, make a call. <laughs> true or false, your mom attended classes with you at Stanford. Ah, true, yes. Did she do your homework too? <laughs> no, she didn't what, try the what homework. What was the situation around that? I have, you know, I was the first to leave the nest and coming from Arkansas, California was kind of a weird and crazy place and I'm not sure that they were uh, totally convinced that I could go it on my own, so they, they, they came to join me. Yes. And my dad actually started a business out there just so he could spend more time in California. What was the business? Yes, it had to do with oil and gas, but he expanded oh, okay. it out to California just oil so he could spend more time there. Palo Alto. <laughs> that, that's probably a story in itself. Uh, yes, for another time. All right, um, how many times has your dad fired you? <laughs> <laughs> Twice. Both, on, well, one was on our new project here at the Star, right. um, which is, you know, a, kind of a long story, but it all boiled down to the fact that um, at that particular time, I wasn't spending enough money on the exterior of the building, and he just basically said, am I going to have to find somebody else to do your job? <laughs> and uh, not so I left. Not spending enough is not usually the reason why. Uh, I know, I know. That's why it was kind of, I, I think that's why I was getting fired, is I thought I was doing a good job, but then it turned out that maybe I was not doing enough, but Coach Garrett said he'd hired me on the other side. <laughs> As yes. the play caller? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather prepare a gourmet meal or design a new hot pants uniform for the Dallas Steelers? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness, oh, I wouldn't touch an iconic uniform if my life depended on it, so I'd have to go for the gourmet meal, but you don't want to come eat it. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it will not be good. <laughs> not your strong suit? That is not my strong suit. Okay, uh, in June of this year, you were named the 89th most important person in the National Football League by USA Today. Did it bother you that you were only 89? <laughs> <laughs> and who was 88? <laughs> I don't even remember. You've got the list. I don't know. It's just a, it was an honor to be on the list. Okay. Yes. 89 though. That's, <laughs> I don't know if that includes players or, or what. <laughs> it did, I think. It, right. it included a whole host of people. Now this one I, I really love. Now, how did you negotiate the new collective bargaining agreement with the NFL Players Union? Were you the only one that could sell your own apparel? How, is, how does that even work? How do the other owners agree to that? Well, I, I, I tell you what, we are. We are the only NFL team uh, that, that designs and manufactures and, and produces our apparel. And it is no easy undertaking. And I think you have to have, again, a commitment, not be afraid to make an investment. Um, and, and also know that, you know, 
your, your performance actually dictates your success in that area. So, so sometimes it's, it's good and really great, and sometimes it's not so great. But being able to do that gives us complete control of our brand, and that's something that we really like. But I mean, can't, can't the Patriots say the same thing, or the Steelers, or the Redskins? Well, if, if they wanted to take on the task of what it means to, and the commitment and the financial commitment of what it actually means to, to do the manufacturing and the sourcing and, and oh, all so that. Oh, so that was more, more so of the, the issue, it was that you guys are taking on the whole logistical thing. The, the whole chain. logistical thing. So there's there should not be a shirt or a hat that you see in the marketplace that has not come through our doors. So wow. the idea of being able to control your brand, and, and I think, you know, obviously that's the most important thing we do is is control our brand. You know, we, yeah. we want to make sure that we're the ones that are just putting it in the marketplace and so that it's held to the standard that, that we set. Great. Fantastic. All right. Well, Charlotte, it was, was an awesome. absolute pleasure. Great. Glad we didn't have too many distractions so back there. But I, I know. Was, was that okay? okay?